Welcome to a Germs Journey News Desk, an international dialogue about the challenge of supporting community relevant public health communications. Find out more about a Germs Journey at our website, germsjourney.com, or find us on Twitter at Germs Journey. Thank you very much for that introduction, Rob. My name is Caroline Wood and I work as a communications officer at the Nuffield Department of Population Health at the University of Oxford, also known as NDPH. So NDPH specialises in conducting huge studies involving thousands of people worldwide to investigate some of the most important questions relating to health and disease. Our remit covers all areas of health, including cardiovascular disease, cancer, type 2 diabetes, kidney disease, maternal health, and more recently, COVID-19. But we know that just generating evidence is only one part of improving global health. We need to communicate our research in a way that empowers the public to make informed decisions about their lifestyles and their health care. But at the same time, we also need to listen to patients and the wider public to ensure that our research is actively meeting their needs. So as a department, we are very committed to finding ways for our researchers and the wider public to work closely together, both in designing research projects and also in delivering the communication method messages. So our three speakers today really illustrate the breadth of our work. Each one will speak for about five minutes and then you'll have the opportunity to ask your own questions in an open Q&A. So first, Dr. Goa Ayman will describe how priority setting partnerships engage clinicians, patients and the wider public to identify unanswered research questions. Anne Whitehouse will then introduce us to the recovery trial the world's largest clinical trial investigating COVID-19 treatments and describe the important role that communications have played in its impact so far. And finally, Dr. Federica Lucivero will introduce us to Indoors, a collaborative online photography exhibition that explored how the COVID-19 lockdowns have impacted older adults. All three of these, of these projects have naturally been made more challenging because of the restrictions of the pandemic. And the lessons that we've learned can be applied to a wide variety of communications campaigns. So we're going to leave all questions to the general Q&A at the end, but if you have any questions that you think of, please do post them in the YouTube chat function as we go along. So first of all, Dr. Goa Ayman will introduce us to priority setting partnerships using the diabetes and pregnancy priority setting partnerships as an example. Goa is a research facilitator at the National Perinatal Epidemiology Unit at NDPH. So I'll hand over to Goa now. Thanks, Caroline. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for, for inviting me. And um, I'm excited to tell you about our experience of doing a priority setting partnership, which I'll uh, shorten to PSP because it will make the talk three times as long saying all three words. Um, in, the, in the picture that you showed before, that was our steering group. Caroline, do you mind going back one? I just want to um, uh, introduce a couple of people. So we, we, we had a, a large steering group, and this is um, just a proportion of the, the number of people involved. And I just wanted to say thanks to every single one of them. Uh, they all um, added so much value to this work. I just wanted to point out um, Marion Knight, who's um, my... Uh, supervisor and um, she was co-leading the project with me um, and uh, Catherine Cowan um, so they're the two ladies on the left on the right hand side um, and um, Catherine uh, was our senior research facilitator uh, sorry a senior James Linda Lyons facilitator so she she was really guiding us through this entire process um, and, and was absolutely wonderful um, so thanks thanks Caroline we can move on to the next one um, so uh, 
Priority setting partnerships or PSPs um, are projects basically developed by the James Lynn's Alliance, um, which is it, itself a UK based um, initiative that was set up in 2004. And it falls under the National Institute of Health Research, which is um, essentially the uh, research arm of the NHS. Um, so normally researchers and um, researchers and industry, so pharmaceutical industry and also funders of research um, will direct where research happens um, and what research happens. Um, but often the priorities um, for research that's directed by them will differ very much from uh, people who are users of health services and also healthcare professionals that um, support these people. Um, so the JLA essentially develops PSPs to address this gap. Um, so to find out from people who use healthcare services and healthcare professionals, what the priorities for research should be according to them. Um, and it's really a way to make sure that research is of value and um, has big impacts to the end users of research, really. Um, so ultimately, the, at the end of the uh, framework, the, the process of the PSP, we have some priorities for research identified. And I'll tell you a, bit, a, bit, a little bit more about that in a sec using our example. Um, but by sharing those priorities with uh, funders of research and researchers, we make sure that they're researching um, questions of importance to the ultimate beneficiaries. Um, happy to move on to the next one. Thanks, Caroline. Um, so our PSP was in diabetes and pregnancy, and actually we were the 101st one to finish. Uh, that was supported by the James Lind Alliance. Um, so actually there have been hundreds really before um, that have looked at different health areas. We are just one example. Um, so uh, the, the framework that the JLA PSP process um, has set out is very flexible to work with the different um, conditions, health conditions. So your sort of the people that you're trying to engage will be very different depending on what the PSP's focus is. Um, so the, the, the framework offered by the PSP process is um, very flexible to enable us to work with, with the different groups of people that we're working with. So um, our PSP was diabetes and pregnancy, and um, it, there's increasing, we know that the, the rates of diabetes are increasing and it's a, it's a building um, condition uh, that uh, uh, needs further research really. Um, and we're, we're told by women who have experienced diabetes in pregnancy that there's a lack of consistent evidence-based information to support best care. And actually that's echoed by healthcare professionals as well. Um, so we set up the Diabetes of Pregnancy PSP in uh, 2018 um, with um, funding from the Diabetes Research Wellness Foundation and also funding from the Nuffield Department of Population Health and the University of Oxford John Fell Fund. And we partnered with um, major diabetes charities, JDRF and Diabetes UK, and of course the James and Linda Lyons to then create the partnership um, and our steering group was brought together. Are you happy to go to the next slide? Um, so the process that we followed um, was very much the quite close to the the framework set out by the, PS, uh, the JTN's Alliance for, for PSPs. And um, of course, um, focusing on diabetes and pregnancy, we wanted to work with um, women who um, had experience of planning pregnancy or had experienced pregnancy with diabetes, their families and actually wider support networks and healthcare professionals. Um, so that was our the, the groups that we were wanting. And we were UK focused, actually. So um, we we the, the the first step was to understand what questions were important to people. So we set a very broad uh, scope. We wanted to understand what the um, questions were in diabetes, sorry, in pregnancy. So the time before to well after pregnancy, 
with diabetes of any type. So it's a very broad scope. Um, and we left it very broad intentionally to be able to get the public's perspective um, on what is important rather than narrowing it down and potentially missing out on, on themes that were important. So we did a survey to open up with um, to collect the initial questions and um, essentially said, what are your three most important questions that have gone unanswered for you? Um, and we released that uh, on paper and online. And um, we did that intentionally because um, what we were finding as we monitored the response rates, we weren't hearing from certain groups. And actually, we could then approach those groups um, in, in hospital clinics um, and say, well, we haven't heard from X group and we need to hear more from them. Would you be able to target um, uh, collecting responses from those? And that was a, a method that we used to, to up representation. Um, so we, we received over a thousand questions um, and um, we did a bit of work with those questions um, to uh, hone them into um, a shortened list um, to then put back out into a second survey. So our initial survey collected questions over six months um, from uh, I forget what the dates were, um, June to November 2019. So this was pre pre-pandemic, so we were able to do the paper-based surveys there. Um, but then by the time we'd done the processing of the questions to then have a, a, a long list to go out for our second survey, um, the, the pandemic had hit. So we were um, mid-May to July 2020 that we'd released the second survey. Um, and um, we obviously couldn't do the paper, the paper-based option. So um, we offered it online only. Um, uh, and so what we asked the same groups of people to do was um, uh, pick their top 10 from, from that list so that we could have a shortened uh, priorities list um, <clears throat> for the final stage, which was um, a, a online workshop. So normally the workshop would take place face to face and we were the second PSP to hold one um, online, um, wholly online. Um, so um, the aim of the workshop was to bring together a smaller group with lots of representatives across those um, women, families and healthcare professionals with different experiences and expertise um, to then identify together um, the, the top 10 priorities. So that's what you can see in the little picture. There is one of the focus groups um, uh, discussing the questions and then they agree a ranking order. Um, what we, I should just quickly say, so for the, obviously going only online for the second survey meant that obviously some groups were disadvantaged by um, only being able to uh, take part online. Um, but we, we did monitor for representation and tried to do targeted recruitment for the final workshop to, to help balance the voices across the groups that we hadn't heard from enough. Um, so if we go to the next one, is that the, the results? So, yeah. So we, we, we did um, finally get to a top 10, and that's what you can see in the little picture there. Um, we, we released that as an infographic at the end of 2020, um, and um, we announced every, um, the top 10 at the Diabetes UK Professional Conference, um, which is uh, for healthcare professionals and researchers in diabetes. Excuse me. Um, and um, the feedback from the participants um, felt that the questions reflected a good range from well before to post pregnancy and applied to all different group, um, types of diabetes. And it had relevance to women, their families and healthcare professionals. Um, so everyone sort of felt that they'd, they'd been listened to and it was a consensus approach, which, which everyone valued. Um, but I hope that just um, seeing that example, the work through example, how the voices of women, uh, well, the, the interest, the group in our case was women, uh, their families and healthcare professionals, but actually it could apply more generally to patients and public and healthcare professionals more widely, depending on which uh, health, health area you're looking at and how those voices are brought in and inform the next stages of future research. So essentially these questions will be 
um, will help researchers and research funders to focus on the questions of most, most importance to the people that they hope to benefit. And it will balance out with those other research that healthcare professionals and, sorry, healthcare industry and researchers are doing um, alongside. So um, hopefully that's, that's reflected uh, in what I told you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gerda. We will now we will now move on to Anne Whitehouse, who is going to introduce us to the recovery trial, the world's largest clinical trial investigating COVID nineteen treatments. Anne is the director of communications and public engagement at NDPH. So, handing over to to you, Anne. Thank you very much, Caroline, um, and thank you to everybody else who's uh, watching on the live stream or watching after the event. Um, as Caroline mentioned, uh, the recovery trial is the world's largest clinical trial for COVID-19 treatments. Um, it's focused on patients in hospital, um, so clearly the most uh, severely ill patients. It was launched in March 2020 and set up very quickly. Um, it is actually run by two of the departments in the university's medical sciences division. Um, so I should also mention the Nuffield Department of Medicine which has long-standing expertise in infectious diseases um, and also a strong presence in pandemic preparedness. Um, and then NDPH brings uh, very long-standing expertise in clinical trials um, in, in two of our uh, registered clinical trial units who've come together to deliver this particular trial. Uh, so the trial now has uh, nearly 40,000 participants um, and it is very inclusive. Uh, the participants range in age from about six months to around 100. Uh, it does include pregnant women who are often excluded from clinical trials um, and it's broadly representative of the UK population. The trial is uh, run in partnership with all of the hospitals across the UK um, who have actually been delivering it at the front line, uh, obviously alongside uh, treating patients with COVID-19. Uh, so it started off uh, with four treatments that were already in use for other conditions. Uh, so the aim was to find treatments that were readily available and could easily be rolled out. Um, and it, but it was also set up so that it could be adapted um, to include other new existing treatments as they've come along um, and other potential treatments that are already in use for other conditions. Um, we started in the UK, um, but we are now rolling out internationally. Uh, so we've recently launched sites in both Nepal and Indonesia, um, and we're in process of talking to uh, various other countries about running the trial there. Move on to the next one. Um, so uh, you may well have heard about um, the first major breakthrough that we had in the trial uh, that was also actually the first major real breakthrough in the COVID-19 response. Uh, so that was the finding that dexamethasone, uh, which is a steroid that's used for a number of conditions, actually saves the lives of severely ill patients with COVID-19. Um, in February of this year, uh, we also had another positive result of the finding that tocilizumab which is an anti-inflammatory treatment, uh, which is often used for rheumatoid arthritis, uh, also actually helps reduce the deaths in severely ill COVID-19 patients. Um, one of the other aims of the trial um, was to quickly discount any treatments that were being used or were being suggested uh, that they would be useful um, uh, if they weren't actually ineffective. Um, and so we actually tested a number of other treatments and are still testing other treatments. Um, but one of the most high profile uh, findings uh, was also the finding that hydroxychloroquine, uh, which is a malaria drug, is not actually effective uh, for patients uh, with COVID-19. Um, that was particularly interesting and important um, and something of a communications challenge uh, because it was actually being championed um, and actually being taken uh, by some very high profile figures um, who were reluctant to believe the evidence uh, that we provided that it actually isn't effective for COVID-19. Um, and we are continuing to test a number of treatments in the trial um, and in the uh, other countries that are coming board focusing on treatments that are particularly relevant to their uh, particular circumstances. 
Um, so the communications is led by our department um, and our role in this trial has been to lead on the media relations. Uh, we developed a website um, which includes all of the materials relating to the trial. So it hosts the training materials for the clinical staff at the hospital sites. Um, it includes all of the regulatory um, materials um, and uh, a variety of other information uh, for patients. Uh, so things like frequently asked questions uh, an animation that explains the trial very simply um, and all of our news releases uh, relating to results from the trial. Um, we had a deliberate policy of trying to be as transparent uh, as possible from the outset. So uh, that website is fully accessible to anybody, in any, uh, anybody anywhere who is interested in learning more about the trial. Um, we've also had a role uh, in the department in creating the branding for the trial, um, sharing uh, updates via social media, uh, leading on the patient involvement, uh, as well as supporting uh, meetings with collaborators and liaising with funders, particularly around key announcements. Um, so one of the key challenges uh, that we had was uh, just the speed in which we were working. Um, so the trial was set up very quickly, um, which meant there was no no real time uh, for planning. Uh, our website was actually launched within five days um, and it was less than seven days um, between us actually starting work on the trial and actually making uh, the initial announcement um, and letting people know that the first patients had actually been enrolled. Um, one of the things that uh, was really important in terms of making the trial as effective um, and simple as possible for frontline clinical staff to deliver um, was actually streamlining it and uh, minimising the burden in terms of the data that they actually had to collect from patients. Um, so the uh, information that frontline clinical staff uh, have to collect uh, has been pared down to the, the absolute minimum. Um, and that's... Uh, was obviously very necessary and very important uh, for the trial, um, but did create a challenge for us in that we uh, have no way to directly contact participants in the trial, um, which in terms of engaging them and communicating with them obviously uh, made things uh, somewhat more complicated than it might have been um, and would have been with our other trials where we would have contact details for participants. Um, uh, we also had a challenge uh, in that um, because we were using the media as our main mechanism for communications uh, with all of our audiences, um, we wanted to develop case studies to show uh, the impact that COVID-19 was ha having on patients um, and to show um, what was happening on the ground in terms of delivering the trial. Um, but clearly that's very difficult in terms of um, infection control measures in hospitals hospitals, uh, some hospitals being uh, very unwilling even to actually talk about what was happening in relation to the pandemic, particularly in the early stages. Um, uh, but uh, fortunately, we had uh, some hospital partners who um, really kind of understood the importance of allowing access to hospitals. So um, the two quotes on the right uh, illustrate uh, the kind of polar opposites in terms of uh, attitudes uh, to allowing access to hospitals. Um, and also supporting us in terms of finding patient case studies um, and allowing their clinicians to talk openly about the trial. Um, one of the other challenges we had was that there are multiple partners who have enabled the trial to happen. Um, so that includes our funders, uh, several government bodies, um, uh, the very many hospital sites. Uh, we were also working very closely with colleagues across the university. Um, and our publications uh, show that there are actually around 4,000 staff who have been involved in the trial, uh, both at the Oxford Coordinating Centre and at those 177 hospital sites in the UK. Um, and we're quite a small team. We're a team of six uh, based in the department. Uh, and this is one of many projects that we're working on, um, although obviously it was uh, probably the most important one, particularly at the height of the pandemic last year. Um, and as Caroline mentioned, obviously, uh, we've been doing it all uh, from our homes, uh, which has been a challenge uh, for everybody, um, but obviously made the coordination uh, that much harder. 
Um, so in terms of the successes, um, we set up with three main objectives for our communications. Uh, so firstly, what we were aiming to do was support recruitment into the clinical trial um, uh, by virtue of making people um, who might be unfortunate enough to find themselves in hospital um, or their relatives or friends um, aware of the trial. So at least they would have some recognition um, of what it was all about um, if they uh, were asked either to consent to be part of the trial or were asked to consent on behalf of a, a relative. Um, the trial actually very quickly became the fastest recruiting trial in medical history. Um, clearly, that's not just due to uh, what we did on the communications front, but is um, also due to the, uh, unfortunately, uh, very large numbers of cases that there were in the UK at that time. Um, we also set out to uh, disseminate results very rapidly so that they could be put into practice worldwide um, really as soon as we knew about them. Uh, so we made the decision uh, in terms of disseminating our results to actually um, make them known uh, publicly um, as soon as we had gone through the process of obviously making sure that they were checked and uh, double checked uh, by our steering committee and by our data monitoring committee um, and by other uh, senior members of the, the trial team team. Um, uh, that was a, something of a challenge because it was not the way that uh, research is announced normally. Uh, normally, the convention is to wait for a fully peer-reviewed paper. Um, we decided not to do that because that uh, often can take many months. And in these uh, particular circumstances, obviously, it was really important to get the results out as rapidly as possible. Um, uh, we also set out to generate wider interest in and uh, understanding of the importance of clinical trials, uh, which broadly speaking hadn't been talked about that much really um, uh, by members of the public uh, or in the media uh, before the pandemic. Um, and we certainly have seen more discussion of clinical trials over the last year than ever before. Again, uh, clearly, obviously, not just down to us, um, although we'd like to think we'd played our part in that, um, but also obviously down to uh, people working on other uh, trials related to COVID-19, particularly the vaccine trials. Um, but heartening to see that uh, clinical trials will be being discussed by the G7 leaders um, who are actually meeting in Oxford next week. Um, so uh, as you'll see, we had huge interest from the media in the trial. Um, we've had over 18,000 items of media coverage uh, about recovery uh, since March last year. Um, we were really pleased that many clinicians were willing to get involved and to support our communications efforts, um, which was uh, really uh, an amazing uh, thing for them to do, given that they were delivering the trial on the front line, as well as caring for patients. Uh, so some of them, as you can see, got involved in a social media campaign uh, that we ran on International Clinical Trials Day last year. Um, the dexamethasone results that I mentioned uh, were put into practice just a few hours after the announcement uh, in the UK and then very shortly after afterwards worldwide. Um, and in April, uh, Matt Hancock actually announced a significant investment um, in a new data-driven kind of service to support uh, the way clinical trials are run. Um, again, none of the, these things are uh, clearly just down to our, our, our work and recovery. Um, uh, but really heartening to see that uh, clinical trials really have been put on the agenda. Um, in terms of our participant engagement activity, um, mentioned obviously that clearly that was difficult um, at the outset, partly because of the time frame, uh, partly because the participants were in hospital, we didn't have access to them, um, and obviously they were severely ill. Um, so, but we did manage to uh, work with hospitals uh, and with the media to develop a number of case studies, um, which were really powerful in terms of uh, generating engagement from other members of the public. Um, and we have also had some of the patients who have recovered uh, tell their stories in other webinars with uh, researchers and clinicians. Um, and uh, I've mentioned kind of data-driven processes. We worked very closely with NHS Digital, um, who provided uh, data to support um, producing the results for the trial. 
We've also worked with them to actually set up a completely new process um, to allow us to communicate directly with the participants, um, but making sure that that data is retained within the NHS, um, because we were conscious that some uh, participants had concerns around data privacy um, and about their data being shared uh, with third parties. Um, So that process is uh, now um, available for use, but being developed and refined um, and will be available for other researchers to use in the future. Um, and we have set up an advisory panel um, of participants who are now well enough to work with us on ongoing communications, um, uh, who will be involving in um, dissemination of future results um, and also um, co-opting some people to our advisory board. Um, so I'd just finally like to uh, thank all of the partners um, involved. Um, this is just a snapshot of the people uh, who have been involved. Obviously, most importantly, uh, our participants in the trial um, and our hospital sites, um, now including uh, the hospital sites uh, in Nepal and Indonesia as well. Um, our main funders, who were the National Institute for Health Research, UK Research and Innovation and Welcome. Um, and there were, were many, many other partners partners who are involved. Um, So this is uh, just a snapshot of those who um, have helped to make the trial happen. Thank you, Anne. Uh, And finally, Dr. Federico Lucivero will give us a quick introduction to Indoors, a collaborative photography exhibition that took place last year. Federico is a senior researcher of data and ethics at the EFOX Centre at NDPH. Thank you, Caroline. Um, so um, let me just go like straight to the idea behind this uh, this exhibition. Um, so throughout the, the the pandemic, the focus has been on keeping all the residents safe through several measures, um, and uh, we have seen like older people has been you know, like uh, the, the the focus of many of the restrictive measures that have been there. Uh, we've been talking about the importance of shielding people. We have been talking about the importance of, you know, protecting people in care homes. But at the same time, where their lived experiences during lockdown and during like this very challenging time really um, there, really highlighted, really um, discussed and seen, uh, in a way, what this exhibition that uh, we have brought together was trying to do was really bringing these experiences into the spotlight and um, giving a voice and showing them and bringing this, um, yeah, bringing these voices of these people uh, in the um, in the general uh, discourse and in the general discussion and debate on the pandemic. Um, so uh, what we did was to have like portrait and stories of older people's lockdown experiences um, to and, and display them and at the same time reflect on them um, from the point of view of our um, expertise in uh, social science, ethic and history. So let me go a little bit more uh, in detail in this. Um, next slide, please. Um, so um, how it started? It started uh, in uh, the first uh, lockdown in the spring 2020, when photographer Adam Stender took some portraits of residents in Tower Hamlets in London um, at their doors and windows. It started as a side project for him, um, and he needs like half an hour when we could go at do groceries. He would just also like uh, take uh, photos of people of uh, of people from their uh, from their windows, like after having agreed with them, uh, because like he put like this like kind of uh, Facebook uh, announcement and Facebook post about um, about this project. So people were really keen. Um, and he was publishing, and then he was also taking the chance to, to, to chat to them and to ask them about their experience of lockdown. He recorded this and he put everything on his blog, uh, which called uh, Life Under Lockdown. Uh, then on a V Day celebration in May, um, Adam focused, uh, brought together all the photos of uh, people on. Um, 
like of older people, people who had lived throughout uh, through the Second World War, um, and um, and I came across this this um, this photo, in this, this photos and this material, and I found it really striking. And it, what was striking again was the fact that um, it was a lot of talk about uh, the relationship between the war. And, and the pandemic at the time. Um, and at the same time, what these stories were showing, what the images of these people were telling was that maybe um, there was something missing in that um, in that talk. It was like, it was more ret rhetoric than actual, um, uh, uh, than, 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 than lived experience in there. So um, I thought this was like a great opportunity to uh, collaborate with Adam and um, next slide, please, uh, Caroline. What I did was to bring together some of my colleagues from the Welcome Center for Ethics and Humanities, uh, that is um, uh, linked to the, the Dranfi Department of Population Health um, and the ETOC Center, which is part of the, of the department and um, bring together the expertise that we have in um, exploring like the social and ethical dimensions uh, of, um, of, of, of uh, healthcare uh, innovation as well as like uh, um, long-term care uh, for vulnerable communities um, together with, uh, as I said, like other colleagues who do more uh, work more on the history of health and infectious disease and focus especially on the Second World War. And so we created the, basically um, this team and together with Adam, we went through, um, we, we engaged like in several discussions. Um, can we go to the next slide, Caroline, please? And uh, we basically had, um, we, we worked with these photos, uh, we worked with, um, with, with the stories and the interviews that he had collected. Um, we took it a little bit as a, a qualitative research project uh, and, um, and um, basically uh, identified some themes that we saw uh, as emerging in this in this material um, so uh, and we use these themes basically to uh, structure the exhibition so there were like four themes um, the first one was about uh, was exploring the issue of like isolation and showing um, how um, people were uh, suffering in these conditions where uh, they could um, they were refrained by uh, doing, by engaging in their usual activities and uh, how this would have uh, an impact in their lives. Um, then there was a second theme that was a theme of connectedness where uh, we were also um, highlighting the enormous resourcefulness of people who, older people who were engaging with um, relationship, uh, with, um, with new technologies and engaged like in new forms of relationships and engagement with the community. Um, the third theme was exploring the, uh, the, 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 the difficulty in coping between the, this, this, this tension between like keeping safe and wanting to be safe on the one hand and being afraid of, you know, of going out, of catching the virus and so on. And at the same time, the need that these people have of making the most of life. And um, as uh, one of our colleagues was pointing out, this is a very recurrent theme, especially when working with older people of um, the, 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 the point where they are in life is very is very important because it feels like there is not so much time to just like being locked uh, up at home for uh, for a year or so it's a lot of time it feels like much longer uh, and uh, much more of a missed opportunity and then the fourth theme was the theme of uh, memories and um, where we were really exploring this uh, comparisons and reflections that people were having in, in, in comparing like the, the, the uh, this is this like people's reflections in comparing the uh, wartime uh, period with um, with the pandemic. 
And so what the portraits do is like really to change and, and our reflections really to challenge the stereotype of older people being frail, a burden on society. And what we try to do is really to show older people being resource, resourceful and uh, finding creative ways to cope and stay connected in difficult times. And just to show you an example, of how uh, it looks like. Thank you, uh, Caroline. Um, this was uh, this taken like from the memory se session, like the memory uh, theme of the exhibition, uh, where you see like um, the, the portrait and uh, we had uh, extracted some um, uh, quotes uh, from the, the, the longer interviews that Adam did with these people. Um, and I, I just want to read it because it, this is particularly telling. It says that it's Maury, um, the person whose uh, portrait here says, uh, and he's 94, he says, we were much more disciplined in the war. In the war, you were told what to do, you did it. Now people are doing their own thing. They're not listening. It's never going to get cured unless people people abide in what time we were told what to do and we did it. Um, and it was like a very interesting reflection actually on, on showing that, um, you know, like the different attitudes. And what also I think this quote shows is how, how much we, you know, we, we, we could have and have learned from, uh, from older people in how you deal with this like um, public emergency and, uh, you know, like also like the different, uh, different ways of dealing with it in like in different societies. And it really questions all the initial rhetoric about like the, the virus being like the enemy in Second World War. Um, so um, what we are trying to do is like people were hoping that people will leave the exhibition with a sense of like understanding also the responsibility to all the members of our society and um, understanding what it means to build like stronger communities. So if I can like reflect on the maybe like the difference between this project and the other ones um, is that we were not so much, it's not so much a project that was trying to uh, discuss public health challenges um, or like communicate public health challenges, but it was more about creating a space for reflection about ethics um, and about like social aspects in the context of a public health emergency. Um, and uh, the last slide, please, Caroline, um, just to give you a sense of how this was delivered. Um, so uh, we had like beautiful plans of um, fantastic plans of, 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 of uh, uh, presenting, showing these photos throughout the windows of a community building here in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Tower Hamlets. Uh, so just to give back to the same community that was engaged in the project. Um, and we had uh, the idea of doing like an in-person la launch where we could invite some of these people. Uh, we were supposed to do this within the Being Human Festival uh, in November last year. And we were just about to do the installation when the second lockdown was announced. So we couldn't do that. Um, instead, we just kept the exhibition online. You're very welcome. I mean, the good, the good news is that you're very welcome to go on uh, the website that it's, uh, you can find on the slide and, uh, and check it out. You'll see the, all the, all the, 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 the themes, the, the photos and, um, and the quotes. Uh, the, the photos are beautiful, uh, by the way. Um, and, um, but we, and, and we, so we had a, a launch, like an online launch where we basically brought in uh, one of the participants through a pre-recorded video. It was complicated to have them on Zoom. And then uh, we all like discussed some of the themes with the photographer. We did a second launch as well in uh, April. A second like discussion as well in April this year uh, because it was like another festival we participated to. Hopefully in the summer we'll be able to get the exhibition online so if you're interested uh, do drop us a line we'll let you know more about that. Um, and I think with this I yeah uh, yeah present it and open to give you the word Caroline. Thank you very much, uh, Federica. Um, I'm not sure whether we've um, we've got much time now for a Q and A, but uh, we have had one come in. Um, health communications includes helping people to understand the research and development process of therapies 
And what more can we do to support education that demystifies these processes? So I think we've got uh, just two minutes. Um, and I think um, you said you might have uh, some ideas on this. Uh, yes, but, um, so it's worth mentioning. So some of the other work relating to clinical trials um, we've been doing has been uh, more directly targeted um, at generating more understanding of clinical trials. Um, so, for instance, we did some uh, work with our participant panel to understand their communications preferences, um, particularly in terms of uh, styles, uh, the digital communications. Uh, so whether they preferred videos, animations, um, what those should look like, uh, who should present them. Um, what we found uh, in terms of the clinical trials was that there was a lot of material out there uh, with uh, researchers talking about um, things. Uh, apologies to my research colleagues <laughs> in the panel. Um, but what our panel actually told us was that they wanted to hear from the participants themselves um, uh, and see them talking about their own experiences. Uh, so one of the things we've done is create a very kind of short video um, that has some of the participants in our other trials talking about um, why they decided to get involved. Um, and actually the first person uh, who starts talking about that talks about um, uh, initial perceptions that um, she was going to be used as a guinea pig and um, she was quite, you know, come from quite a sceptical position. Um, but actually, once she got involved in a couple of trials, realised that that really wasn't the case um, and that researchers were generally trying to uh, do things for the public benefit. Um, we have also um, recently developed some resources for schools, um, which are on our uh, our website. Um, and we've been also been working with the National Institute of Health Research, who've developed um, a future learn course, uh, which is targeted at adults, um, which includes um, a section on the recovery trial. Um, so the the thinking being that if we can um, do more in terms of kind of educating both at an early age as uh, so, uh, children, but also um, in terms of adults um, who are interested and build on the momentum um, that we've seen over the last year in terms of interest in research, um, that will help. Um, probably should also mention that um, uh, one of the things I've learned from previous experience working um, in tropical medicine uh, was the value of kind of local and regional media. Um, so with a lot of our outreach, although it was through national and international media, we did proactively target uh, local re um, media um, to make sure that we uh, could reach participants kind of across the country and through um, the channels that we knew they were using. Um, but I think there is still a huge amount that we need to do um, in terms of actually generating more understanding around research. And uh, largely that is about um, uh, some of the work that um, Goa shared and that kind of approach in terms of um, getting participants, uh, members of the public involved in actually setting the research agenda as well as um, being involved right through the process. Great. Unfortunately, that uh, is all we have time for. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And if, if you're watching this later, thank you very much also. And I hope it's uh, given you some ideas for yourself of how you can involve the public more in shaping your own communication projects. Thank you. following a germs journey an international dialogue about the challenge of supporting community relevant public health communications you can find us on twitter at germs journey or go to our website germsjourney.com